Hello, welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpoli from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Today's special guest is Shell Hartzer, and today's subject is how to manage rodents in food facilities. Shell's the foremost experts in rodents and all things like that. Um, so it's it's great to have Shell along. Welcome, Shell. Morning. Good morning from outside of Atlanta, Georgia. I see we've got people coming in from all over the world. So hello, everybody. Yeah, I love to see that. Um, mm -hmm. Netherlands, Marlowe's, uh, Jashri from Canada, Trinidad. Come on, let's get every country in the world. Let's let's see. Yeah. We'll have, I'll tell you what, we'll play the video ads and then we'll have a look at where you've come from. Uh, so we'll be back in a couple of minutes. So anyone in particular you want to give a shout out to? Uh, oh, yeah. well, I did see I did see Rome, Georgia up there. So hello to to my my neighbor uh, here in Georgia. Um, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. It's I no. hate seeing this, though, because there's so many cool places I want to go visit. You guys are all from them. <laughs> so I'm going to say a special hello to Angela from Philippines, General Santos City. I've never heard of it, but I've now this that the introductions there are my third favorite part of these webinars. My second favorite part is the questions. Mm -hmm. My first favorite part is of course your presentation show. So here we go. Let's get to it. <laughs> All right. And yeah, you folks always have great questions. So pop those questions into the chat. I will try and keep an eye on it, but Simon's really good about getting to those at the end. So we will save plenty of time for questions. Um, today's topic is rodents. So no matter where you are in the world, and this is why I love seeing where everybody is from here, um, from all over the world, you have rodents um, and they can be a problem, particularly in food facilities. And so I wanted to start out with this. This is very recent news um, within the last couple months, actually. Uh, this is here in the United States, a distribution center for these series of stores was shut down by the FDA, that is the, the U.S. government agency, the Food and Drug Administration, um, and closed down over 400 stores in the United States. And, and that was just in six states um, because of a rodent infestation. And of course, this has hit the news um, and it's it's big because, again, 400 stores for rodents. 
um, huge amount of product recall. Uh, they're estimating it's about $43 million just in the products that they had to recall. That doesn't account for the close time. That doesn't account for the extra cleanings or any of the extra costs. That is literally that $43 million is just the products that they had to pull back in. So you can see that rodents are not just disgusting. They're not just gross. They are a real problem and they can cause a lot of damage to your bottom line. Uh, this one just hit the news about, oh, I want to say about two weeks ago, again, in the United States. This is down in Florida. You can see that the restaurant is called out by name. Um, you can imagine what this does to your brand. You can imagine what this does uh, to your bottom line. Again, this this particular restaurant has been closed for a week now because the rodent infestation is so bad. And once it gets to this point, it's not something that you can just shut down for a couple hours, clean it out and be done with it. This problem took months, took years to get to this point. So it's going to take some time to fix it. So remember this as we go through this webinar and, and I talk about all these things, the, the bottom line here is if you can prevent this from happening, if you can prevent this from getting hugely out of control, like these two examples here, it's not so bad. You can keep it under control. We don't want it to get to this point where it's hit the news and your site is shut down for days, weeks, months even to get these problems under control. And of course, you know, there's the reputational damage, there's the money damage, there's the government potentially stepping in and closing you down. Um, but we have the damage to products. I mean, just the loss of products because rodents have have gnawed at it, have destroyed it, have have defecated in it and contaminated it. We have broken packaging. And remember too that rodents like to chew, they like to gnaw, they, they've got those big front teeth. And so they just constantly gnaw at stuff. And that could be your building, that could be your electrical wiring. There's a statistic that I have not been able to confirm and if somebody can do it for me, I, I'd love to have the, the confirmation that around 30% of fires that they don't know how started, um, so unknown origin, they think are attributed to rodents basically gnawing on wires and starting electrical fires. So, you know, we have structural damage here. And there's also, you know, if we go back to that, that family dollar, that distribution center, Sure, we had rodents all over, but if you have rodents in a specific area of your plant, of your food facility, of your distribution center, the entire thing could potentially be considered contaminated because you have product that's being held in an area that's, that has rodents. So maybe there's no damage to that product yet, the, the rodents haven't gotten it, but just the fact that it's stored in that space where there's a rodent infestation, that product is now considered contaminated because it's food that's held under insanitary conditions. So consider this, again, when you see these, these evidence of rodents, you see rodents running around that, sure, maybe there's no damage to the product yet, but that product can still be considered contaminated, might still need to be recalled. So this is why we care about rodents because they, they just, all over can cause so much damage and so many different types of damage when you think about it. So the three main species that we deal with really, again, throughout the world are the house mouse, the roof rat, and the Norway rat. And again, no matter where you are in the world, you will have one or more of these species. Rats are obviously a little bit bigger than mice, mice are the smaller ones, but really the same overall biology. These three species look at what we have as people, look at our food, our shelter, our sources of water and say, I want that. They, we, we provide everything that they need. And especially if you're in a food facility, again, whether that's food processing, food storage, anything like that, we are providing this, this buffet of food for them. Of course, we want to save that for ourselves, so we don't want them in there. And there is where the trick lies of how do we do this? How do we do rodent control? Because this is something that we don't want to see. Again, we have now lost product. We have lost time. Um, product around this will be considered contaminated. Um, all of this is, is a waste of money, um, as well as continuing to let this rodent population 
continue and breed and grow and get to more product. So looking for items like this, and you can see here, I, I realize this isn't the best picture. Um, I was in kind of a dark warehouse at the time. Um, you can see the, the droppings and you can see the chewed up bits of packaging and you can see the, um, the chewed pasta that's on there as well. Again, all of this has to be thrown out. This is no longer good. So waste of money. Additionally, rodents are, are very much disease carriers. Um, we, we can all go back through the history books and talk about the Black Plague and what the Black Plague did to, to Europe and how many people it killed and how that really changed geographies even. But there's a lot of other diseases out there as well that rodents can carry. Um, and, and if anyone is still out there, we still have cases of the plague. The plague is not gone. Um, it just so happens that we don't have a lot of cases anymore and they're usually um, somewhat sporadic. One of the big ones that we deal with in the United States, which is actually spread by, by deer mice and, and the urine and feces of deer mice is hantavirus. And that can be deadly just as the, the black plague is, is very deadly. So, you know, all of these diseases, all of these things are, are are items that we have to be concerned about. Again, it's not just the damage that the rodents are causing. It's not just the loss of money from the loss of product. We have to worry about them spreading salmonella. We have to worry about them picking up pieces of food, transferring that and spreading salmonella, spreading the plague still, hantavirus from the droppings and the urine that they leave behind. So rodents really are this big problem from so many different aspects. And, and we have to think about that. We also know, I, I mentioned salmonella, but it's also E. coli and listeria. Okay, these are foodborne diseases that humans get, make us sick. And again, that's a risk to your product. That's a risk to your brand. That's a risk to your customers. Um, so they, they did this, this experiment and found that pest rodents entering or infesting food products or establishments um, that could carry these physical and microbiolo microbiological hazards. Um, and so their, their ending statement there is to monitor the pest and have good hygiene practices during preparation, storage and serving products keeps the food safe. So remember, it is a lot of things. Um, again, we have a couple more, Staphylococcus, Toxoplasma, a whole bunch of very nasty things that rodents are carrying around and potentially dropping off and transmitting to us as people. So we have to be aware of that. And especially if you do have a rodent infestation, um, taking proper precautions to clean up so that employees, that uh, people who are cleaning up after that mess um, do not potentially get sick. If you are an audited facility, uh, especially in the United States, I know in Europe as well, a lot of different countries, you are subject to third party audits. And so it is an audit violation to have pests in your facility. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm calling out my home state of Georgia in the United States here. Um, this is a, a restaurant that was forced to close. The picture is terrible. If you go in and uh, Google the video, you can actually see the rats running along the, the lines there. I have it circled where it is, but um, so this is an audit violation. So if you are an audited facility, um, just having these animals in your plant is a violation. Um, not monitoring for them, not putting proper controls in place is an audit violation. Uh, if your suppliers, if your vendors find out about this, uh, they may cancel contracts. Uh, I found out today as I, I was going through the news article that that family dollar, uh, the state of Arkansas is suing that company now because of that shutdown and because of the rodent infestation. So we have legal action now that can be taken to companies. And of course, as I mentioned, because this has all hit the news, whether it's family dollar, whether it's McDonald's, whether it's American Deli, this has hit the news. So now you have public perception. And how much is the public going to want your product once they know that you have rats running through your facility, that you have mice, that you have this contamination. So you, you have loss of consumer confidence in your product and they will stop buying it. They will stop going to your stores for that reason. So all of these reasons get us to the fact that we need to control rodents because again, wherever you are, you are at risk of having some type of rodent infestation. 
Maybe it's not house mice, maybe it's deer mice, maybe it's another type of mouse. Norway rats and roof rats are, are predominant throughout the world, if, especially in tropical areas. You're gonna have more roof rats. Um, in temperate areas, Norway rats are just about everywhere across the world. So we really want to try and prevent this from happening in the first place, which is of course hard because as I said, we have what they want. We're producing the food. We're, we're giving them the shelter. We're saying, hey, look at all this great stuff we have. Oh, but stay on the outside. And that's the trick is how do we keep them out? How do we prevent them from even getting to that point that they can come in, that they can infest the food? It is hard because they are small, they are smart, they are tricky, they want to hide from us. They are mostly nocturnal, so they're going to be more active at night when we're not looking for them. This is not easy. So a lot of people will tell you, oh, you know, run control is easy, just clean up all the food. Well, how do you clean up all the food when that's what you produce? You can't just empty your facility and be like, nope, we're good, because then you have nothing to sell. You have nothing to, to give to your consumers. So it is hard because we have what they want. So the first thing we have to start with is inspection and, and looking at our area and looking at what may be drawing them in, the access points, the food sources. When we talk about sanitation, it's about trying to limit the amount of food sources. Again, we can't eliminate those food sources, but we can limit them and we can make them harder to get to in some cases. We have to monitor, I mean, again, small little animals that are mostly active at night. So if we put those monitoring devices out and we trap some, we find out where they are, that's an early warning system to us. Rodenticides can be used depending on what country you are. I realize that there are some countries with more limits on rodenticides than others, so keep that in mind. Um, make sure you're always following your local regulations and laws when it comes to using pesticides. And this is a team project. This is not one person's job. Everybody has to work on this. Every single person in a food facility is responsible for rodent control because they can keep their eyes open. They can start looking for stuff. They can tell people when they find items. So it really is a group project when we consider this. And when you think about this as well, realize that as I go through these things individually, these are not isolated items. They all work together and they're all interconnected. Um, so, which again, makes the system a little complicated. But when you start thinking about it and start thinking about what you can do and how we can prevent these infestations from happening, again, we can have that teamwork. We can start that process. So I mentioned that a lot of people will tell you about sanitation and how sanitation is easy. You just clean up all the food source and your problem goes away. Um, in a way, inspection is very easy as well. Um, inspection is just look at everything all the time, which of course is hard because how do you look at everything all the time? You have a job to do. Your folks on the line, um, everybody in your facility has a job to do. But that doesn't mean that they can't be aware of what to look for, potentially where to look, and just to keep their eyes open as they do their normal job, okay? One of the things that people forget about rodent control is that most rodent issues start on the outside. Rodents are native, okay? So they, they're out there. We tend to through the inside and we tend to think of, you know, sealing it up and inspecting the inside, but don't forget to inspect the outside. If we can keep those rodent populations a little bit lower directly around the building, directly around those structures, there's just going to be fewer of them, fewer of them to get inside the building, fewer of them to infest. So don't forget to do that outside inspection as well. Keep those, those plants, those bushes, those trees trimmed down so they have less habitat. Make sure the outside sanitation is good. All of these things that you can start looking for. And of course, if you can see the rodents running around, you know you have a problem, but they're small, they're sneaky, they like to hide. So we can look for that secondary evidence of what they may be leaving behind. So even though we don't see a rodent, we may see that evidence and we can start to think about how to control that. So we wanna look for those chew marks. If you start to see packages that are broken open and maybe the, the droppings that are around. And of course, when it comes to sanitation, it's those conducive conditions of food, water, and shelter. And how do we limit those? Again, 
you're you're here, you know, at the food safety and and food plants, we have food. So we know where the food is. So how do we make that just a little bit more protected, a little bit harder for those rodents to get to? Shelter, of course, we've got our buildings. We can't just tear down our buildings and say, okay, we're done. But we can make some of those shelter points a little bit less hospitable and have the rodents thinking, this is not a good place for me to be. I'm going to go somewhere else. So when we talk about these inspection points, um, you can see from that, that top left picture there, I've got a, a pen and you can see the droppings. These were rat droppings. They're a little bit bigger than mouse droppings. Um, so you can see, and actually you can see a little bit of food product that was there. I didn't, I, I didn't take the picture of the food, but you can definitely see that we have a rodent problem here because we have all these rodent droppings. I didn't even need to see the broken packaging or, or the chewed up marks on, on some of the food. We know we've got droppings. We know we've got rodents there. That middle picture around that pipe, you can see that, that it's kind of lighter. You can see those two teeth mark, those two front teeth gnawing at that to make that hole just a little bit bigger so they can use that as a, as a runway to get in and out. And of course, there's a dropping right there as well. So we know that that's relatively fresh. We can see the fresh chew marks and of course, any of the entry points. So that last picture there on the right is a cute little mouse using that, um, using that pipe to go back and forth inside and outside the facility. Okay. So all of these things to look for. Now we may not have, you know, you, you may see this open hole again, back to that middle picture. You may see that, that hole, there may not be any chew marks. There may not be any droppings that are sitting right there, but that's still a potential entry point. And if we can seal that up, Again, we've prevented a problem from even starting. So hopefully as you're looking through, as you're doing your inspections, you're seeing these entry points, you're seeing these sanitation issues that can be addressed so that we don't have the problem in the first place. However, once you do see this, we know we definitely have a problem and have to do something about it. I keep coming back to this food, water, and shelter aspect. All living things need food, water, and shelter. And we provide this for the rats and the mice. Now, I know that there's some areas of the world that we just don't have great storage options, okay? And maybe we had a flood and maybe stuff got wet. Thinking about all of these things and thinking about how you're storing the food, where you're storing the food, and what the rodents have access to starts to get us to that point where we may limit that access. Uh, there's no real good estimates of how much food we lose every single year to rodent damage. Um, they, we just don't have the statistics on it. It's impossible to tell, but um, they think in some developing countries, it can be as high as 30 to 40% of all food is lost to rodent damage. But that's huge. That's a lot. So when we see areas like this, where there's all this food, all this habitat, what can we do about this to try and minimize that? Can we move this food somewhere else that might be a little bit more sheltered? Can we maybe improve the drainage so we don't have all that water? We don't have the, the damaged grain that we have here. Again, this is not easy. If, if it sounds like I'm standing up here, you know, just saying, hey, just clean up all the food. It, it makes all your problems go away. I realize it's not that easy. We have a lot of different conditions that we have to deal with. But when you start thinking of this from the rodents perspective and you start, you know, kind of thinking like a rat, if you will, you can start thinking about how they're going to get in and where they're going to access this, um, you know, and, and start thinking of, of how to make it harder for them. We're never going to eliminate the rodents. All right. They've been around for probably longer than humans have. I'll have to look up that statistic, but they're smart. So we're going to keep battling them, but we can win the battles and keep them to the outside and keep them down and protect our food. It's not just the food. And uh, this is a picture I took in, in a food processing facility. And this is obviously not the packaged food. This is obviously not the raw ingredients. This was underneath some processing lines. And you can see that this is not new. This did not just happen. This has been there for a while. So 
looking at the waste, looking at where discarded product goes to, looking at the processing lines where there may be spillage and trying to minimize that. Because again, this is easy access. It's nice and dark down there. You can actually kind of see my, my flashlight beam there um, illuminating this as I take the picture. We also have that, that drain grate. So we may have rodents that are, are coming up through that drain grate to access that food. Um, we certainly have a water supply. Uh, so again, everything a rodent could possibly want for its growing little family is right here, easily accessed to them. And it's protected. It was underneath this line. One of the other things you can, uh, you can look for when it comes to rodents and rodent activities is look for some of the warmer spots. You know, rodents like warmth. And so if, if you're in a tropical area, again, a lot of things are warm. I get it. Um, but depending on where you are, if you have machinery with with um, motors, um, think of even something like a refrigerator, an ice machine. That motor keep th keeps things a little bit more warm and a little bit more contained, and they like those areas. So look for areas that are a little bit warmer when it comes to rodents. I mentioned the outside. Um, again, this is a picture I took uh, outside of a warehouse. Um, you can see that the wall is pretty well sealed up, it looks like, right? Well, unfortunately, they have all this greenery, all of this habitat pushed right up against that wall. And so you can't see the base of the wall. And as I as as we were inspecting through this, there are actually a whole bunch of rodent burrows within that um, mass of vegetation. And so you have very protected habitat that they're very comfortable in. And what you can't see is a little bit farther down is a doorway that was not sealed very well, um, which provided access for those rodents to go into the building. So they had this nice, safe, protected habitat. Short distance away, they had an entry point to get in, to get their food, to get their water and come back out. So just by moving this vegetation away from those walls and creating this, this vegetation free border, we made that area very unfriendly to them and they started moving farther away from the facility. So don't forget the outside. This is where a lot of our problems start. This is where a lot of our problems occur. And if we control them on the outside, we've got the inside very well protected and we prevent, back to that whole prevention aspect, we prevent them from getting in. Uh, this was a picture I took outside of a brewery. This is, uh, again, great habitat. It's nice and protected. Um, sitting at all of these pallets were old pallets that had been sitting out there for a while. Now imagine what happens if you then go and you need some of these pallets, you pick up these pallets, you know, get a forklift, pick up a bunch of these pallets and bring it into your facility. And all the mice are living in those pallets. You've just transferred that into your facility. So again, that outside sanitation, not just the food, but the habitat, where are they living? How do we make that habitat look less inviting to them, less protected. Remember being small, a small little mammal, they have a lot of things that prey on them. So they want to be protected. They want to be safe. If we make that area open and, you know, lots of open spaces, they don't like that because lots of predators can see them. So they're going to go elsewhere. So it's not just the food that you have to think about when it's sanitation, but it's also the habitat that's out there. Uh, this is inside. Um, again, what more can I say about this? Um, perfect habitat. This is this is in a stock room. Uh, this had been there for at least a week and they were having a mouse problem in here. And I can tell you that once we cleared all that out, um, we found a whole bunch of mice nests inside that cardboard. Mice and rats love cardboard. Again, it's nice and soft. They can chew it up. It's it's fun. There's usually food debris on it. Cardboard is fantastic for rodents. Okay, let's talk about exclusion. Um, that first picture on the left, I can't tell you how many times I see that. Close the doors. I mean, whenever we leave them an opening, they will use it. Think of all the good smells that are coming out of your facility from all the good food that you're making there, all the food that you're storing there. And that just wafts outside. So if you leave a door open, if you leave a window open, a vent unscreened, rodents are just going to be like, okay, they're inviting me in. I mean, you could have a neon sign that says, welcome, come on in. So think about all the doors around your facility. Think about all the openings Again, we can't potentially seal everything, but 
especially on the ground level, if you know that your problem are mice or Norway rats, don't forget to look up high at some of your upper vents, your upper windows when it comes to roof rats. So knowing what species you have is important to start looking and prioritizing what you want to do. But that first picture of the door propped open, that's an easy fix. Just close the door. But informing your employees, informing everybody at the facility of why we need to close those doors, why we need to leave them shut. And think about all the other pests that are coming in. I mean, the flies, the cockroaches, um, you know, the moss, everything that's coming in through that open door. It's not just the rodents. My picture on the right here, look at your dock doors. Uh, dock doors, because they get used so much, all those trucks coming and going, those seals just start to wear down fairly fast. So as soon as you can see daylight, if you look at that, you know, we're standing on the inside of the facility looking outward so you can see daylight. That means a rodent can get in. That means tons of insect pests can get in. So once you start seeing daylight around a door seal, that door has to be resealed so that it closes fully, so that the seal on the bottom connects with the ground and rodents can't get in. And we mentioned before that rodents are good at gnawing. They're good at getting into stuff. So inspecting those door seals, even when they look okay, even when you can't see daylight, just starting to inspect them and say, you know, quick, quick look at them. Make sure you don't see any gnaw marks. If you do, again, can we reseal that door? Can we put something else up there? Can we look at the outside of where that's happening and see what may be going on so we can prevent that rodent from actually gaining entry? So all of those dock seals you need to keep an eye on. I mentioned that Norway rats and mice are usually pretty low, so we want to look at those doors. Roof rats are the opposite. And you can see from the picture on the left in the background, you see those trees. Um, those trees are actually very close to that side of the building, and the roof rats were using those trees to come up. You know, they, they were nesting in the trees, actually, and just hop on over to the roof. And they had access points down through, you can see the picture on the right, through the fans and through the vents that were on the roof. And then, of course, they had all of those, um, that the pathways, you know, you can see the beams and the pipes and stuff that they would just run around and um, get to the food sources. So if roof rats are an issue in your area, look at the vegetation. Again, that vegetation coming up to connect to the roof that's where their most likely access point is. So we have to remember to look up as well as looking down at the ground level. Um, of course, on roofs as well, depending on how well the roof is maintained, you might have water issues. You might have water pooling up there. Uh, in areas with heavy vegetation, you might have fruits and nuts from the trees and the bushes. So we have a food source up there. And people don't check roofs very much. You know, we have this tendency, we're, we're down here on the ground, so we, we tend to get that, you know, one to three meters that, that we're looking at, that one to six feet that, that we're at, we tend to focus on that. People miss getting up high because we're not up high, so we don't think about it as much. So think about those upper areas as well. When we, I, I told you to look for daylight, you know, especially around doors um, that, that are not sealing very well. When you think of how small of an area these animals need to gain entry, I mean, I don't care how big of a rat you have. I mean, you know, you hear stories about New York and, and all that, that rats are the size of small dogs. Um, they, they're pretty small still. And if they can fit their little skull through the hole, the rest of the body squeezes through. So it doesn't matter how well fed that rat is, doesn't matter how fat that rat is, that little skull is gonna get through that 2.4 centimeter hole and it's gonna get in. There's some great videos if you go to YouTube of, of watching mice and rats squeeze through little holes and it really gives you an idea of what you need to be looking for around your facility to find those small holes, to find those small entry points and seal them up. Uh, as you seal too, make sure that you seal with something that's that's substantial. Uh, we see a lot of foam and a lot of newspaper and a lot of crazy things out there that people use to seal up holes. Remember, rodents are good at chewing they will chew through most of that. So try and use something substantial, something, you know, something that, that's gonna last and be rodent proof, if you will. So um, I've got a, a dime up here, a US dime. Again, that's the small amount that a mouse needs to get through. This larger quarter here, 2.4 centimeters, that's the, that's the space a rat needs to get through. That's it, they squeeze their little skull through and that's it. 
I mentioned using something substantial. Again, um, using a pair of sweatpants and a can of foam is not going to keep those rats out of that facility. Uh, using something substantial, uh, steel wool gets uh, mentioned a lot. I do not recommend steel wool. The product here is a, a specific rodent product, um, the one on the, the right, um, that's made of little shards of metal, basically, within that mesh. And so the rodents literally can't chew through it. Now, I will say um, I have done some sealing that's been temporary sealing because we want to see if the rodents are actually using that as a pathway. So, you know, anything is better than nothing. If what you have is a pair of sweatpants and a can of foam, OK, um, you know, that's that's better than nothing. As long as you come back and do that with something a little bit more substantial, a little bit more hardy. And it's a good way to find out which entry, especially if you've done a lot of sealing, like, you know, you've got a whole wall and, and multiple doors and you seal everything at once. It's a good way to find out which which points the, the rodents are using and accessing, because if they've chewed through it, if they've, um, you know, pushed out that pair of sweatpants or pushed out that piece of newspaper, you know that that's an active pathway. And that's one that you have to focus on and fix first, as opposed to the other ones that, OK, maybe that temporary fix is going to hold for maybe a month or two. You can focus on those high points. So. You know, any ceiling is better than nothing. Just realize that if you are going to use something like foam or newspaper or whatever, you know, a little piece of steel wool, um, it can get pushed out and they will chew through it. But that gives you good information when they do and you can find that. And then you can go back with that nice rodent proof. <clears throat> All right, story time here. So this was a uh, the warehouse side of a food facility that I was working in and they were having a problem with mice. And we knew from what we saw on the outside that the outside was was pretty clean, it was pretty neat. Um, there really wasn't a lot of habitat. We had uh, bait stations on the outside that we were monitoring and there really wasn't much feeding. So we knew that the mice were likely inside. And we knew from monitoring, we had traps, we had glue boards, which again, I know certain countries, I just saw the news about the UK about glue boards. We don't use glue boards in certain countries. We did here. So we knew that we had this one area of the warehouse that was close to the dock doors, that this is where we were catching the mice. It was interesting because it really wasn't the finished product that we were finding them in. So we're going through and again, we keep kind of narrowing it down, narrowing it down to where we're finding the mice. And I mentioned that heat source. Remember that? Well, here's what it was. It was the office, the shipping office where they were. There was a refrigerator and there was lots of food because I, this was a relatively big shipping office. And so there were multiple people in there. They brought their lunches. They brought their dinners. Um, you know, so so there was people food in there. And the mice had gotten in and they were living underneath that refrigerator because it had the warmth, it had the easy access to the food. And so funny enough, in this situation, it wasn't the food product that the facility was producing. It was actually food coming in with people. We don't know how the mice originally got in, um, could have been off of a shipment or whatever, but this is where the mice were. They were actually in this shipping office in this warehouse area. So once we got to that, we were able to pull out that fridge. We were able to do a deep clean, make sure that there was you know, no food crumbs whatsoever. We got everybody out of there for about 24 hours over the weekends, cleaned everything up, set all our traps and managed to get it, get it done in a weekend. Um, but this took... I'd say about two months of slowly, slowly getting this inspection and, and looking at where the evidence was and, and trying to find this. And again, that heat source, we looked for things like the computers, you know, where do we see the most evidence of droppings? And we actually, one of the things we did as well, which got us close to this, this issue, I think a little bit faster, is um, we use game cams, uh, those trail cams that a lot of hunters and things use. Um, we have cameras now that we can use, set up, and they'll they'll take a picture when motion hits it. So we were actually able to see the mice coming out of this refrigerator at nighttime when nobody was there. So that was actually pretty cool. All right, I mentioned that this is a group project. This is not one person's job. This is not just the pest control team or the pest control company that comes in, that it's their job to deal with rodents. 
everybody has a responsibility to look for this stuff, to see this stuff, and to say something. I think that is one of the biggest problems that we have when we have rodent issues is that, you know, people see it and they're like, okay, yeah, I saw it, but who do I tell about this? There's no policies in, in place. Nobody's ever told the employees, hey, if you see something like this, go tell this person, go write it down in this notebook. Uh, going back to that very first slide that I showed you of the family dollar stores, that issue had been ongoing for over a year when they looked back on their on the records and the FDA um, sequestered those records. Um, that issue had been going on for over a year. And when the FDA was called, when the, the U.S. government was called in, it was called in by an employee of that plant. So the employees know what's going on. But if they have nobody to tell, that problem continues, that problem grows, that problem gets to the point where we have to shut down a distribution center, where we have to shut down 400 stores. We don't want it to get there. So giving a little knowledge and a little education to all of the people that work there of what to look for, who to tell, and making sure that the pest control team or the pest control company that you've hired knows to talk to those people or knows where those records are so they can fix that problem. But it's the whole see something and say something. And that last part, I think, gets missed a lot. Um, when I get called in to, to problem accounts, it's the first thing I do is usually start talking to employees. And most of the time, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I see that rat over there all the time. And they've seen it for months. So, but they've never known who to tell or that they even should tell somebody. So that little bit of education every so often, those reminders, hey, have you seen anything? Hey, you know, if you see a rat, you know, to tell us, right? Um, making sure that all of the employees know that because then you get that early warning. You get that, that notification when it's one or two, not when it's thousands running through and destroying your product and shutting down your facility. I mentioned that this is not easy. It's not. Um, and when I tell you some of these stories that I've been involved in, I probably make it sound a little easy, like, oh yeah, we noticed rats, the rats were in the refrigerator. It usually takes months to suss out these problems and look at things and investigate to finally get to those points. It is not easy. And that's why if we can prevent the problems on the front end, we don't have to get to the months and months of work we will have to go through once they do get in. But, but I realize that this is not easy, particularly in food processing, because you have food, okay? We can't eliminate that food. We have trash. I mean, by, by the nature of producing a product, we are going to be left over with food waste, spillage, trash. So it's about thinking of what the attractiveness is there thinking of how we can minimize it. Uh, the doors are a perfect example. If we tell employees that, hey, we have to keep these doors shut so no rodents and no flies get in, you know, that clicks and, and that makes them understand, oh yeah, instead of continuing to prop the door open. If we make sure that the dumpsters and, and the trash gets taken out on a regular basis and gets picked up on a regular basis so it's not overflowing, we have less of an attractive space for those rodents to be in. I have mentioned bait stations and I've mentioned traps and I've mentioned glue boards. Uh, the added point to that I will say is just make sure you follow all of your label regulations. Make sure you follow all of your countries, your states regulations on that. Um, throughout the world, it does differ. So in the United States, we do have rodenticides that we can legally use as long as we do it safely and according to the labels. Uh, in the UK, glue boards were just banned um, for non-professionals, and professionals do have to go through some extra steps to use those. Uh, rodenticides are more challenging to use in Europe, so wherever you are, use these products wisely. Make sure you use them legally. 
Now, uh, I, I've kind of mentioned a couple times between, you know, your pest control team. If you have an in-house team, if you have your employees um, at your site doing that pest control, make sure that they have all the training that they need. Make sure that that training is refreshed every so often. All of you are on this webinar right now, um, you know, refreshing your training on, on rodents, um, keeping that going because there's always a few new things. Um, even though these these animals go back before, you know, almost humankind, there's new research, there's new techniques. So making sure you keep up to date on that. If you are hiring an external company to come in and do your pest control, make sure that they are well trained, make sure that they have their licenses and make sure you work with them. Again, it's not just their responsibility because you've hired them. You have to do that sanitation. You have to look at those doors. You have to make sure your folks are trained to know what they look for so they can find some of these things. So um, whether you have that in-house team doing it or whether you've hired that third party to do it, it's still, um, still your responsibility and still everybody's responsibility. So quick note on bait stations, if you use bait stations, you'll see these black boxes. Um, sometimes they're white, we do have different colors. Sometimes they look like a rock, um, but inside of these, the bait is secured and that's the big deal. We wanna make sure that the, the station is locked and secured so that the only thing that's gonna get into there is the rodent. If you see one of these open, if you see one of these broken, if you see bait spilling out of it, Again, contact your pest control team, your pest control company immediately so that they can address that. We want to make sure that the only thing that's eating this rodenticide is the rodents. Now, we may also have non-toxic bait in there so that we can see, is there feeding activity? Or we may have traps in these stations as well so we can actually physically trap them. The key with these is placement. We want to make sure that they're lined up so that the rodent is gonna enter them easily. You can see from the picture on the left, that hole is in the wrong spot. So that rodent that's gonna be following that wall, following that line is never gonna enter this bait station. Except for the one on the right. Now that one is lined up well. You can see the rat kind of making a beeline for that fence line. It wants to be tucked up against that corner, wants to be tucked up safe. And it'll run right into that bait station. It'll find the trap, it'll find the bait and we can control them that way. Same thing with traps, whether we have snap traps or we have repeater traps, these have to be placed correctly. So my picture on the left here, number one, that trap is in really bad shape. So if a mouse even gets in there, it's just gonna poke its little nose up and be able to lift that lid. So we definitely need to replace this one, but it's also pulled up from the wall. So as that mouse runs the wall, it's not gonna encounter the trap. Now the picture on the other side, on your right hand screen, we see that it's tucked up right there on the wall, the holes lined up. So as that, that mouse runs down that wall, it goes right into the trap and we can control it, okay? Um, I've mentioned glue boards before, so just one more note on this. Uh, glue boards can be effective for small rodents, such as mice and small rats, um, but we do have to follow your local regulations when it comes to that, and glue boards can catch anything, so placement, again, is key. I'm going to harp on this one more time. Everybody is responsible for pest control. Everybody is responsible for keeping their eyes open and telling somebody in charge when they see something so that it doesn't get to the point where that one rat that got in has now has a family of 50 and there's 50 rats or 100 rats or whoever. So make sure that you have that communication. Make sure that everybody knows what to look for and documented it. I, again, if, if you're an audited facility, this is a requirement. You may have government, uh, federal regulations that require you to document this stuff. Plus, if you're not documenting it, how do you see those trends? How do you see what's happening, uh, especially if you have another party doing your pest control? So make sure all of this is documented and recorded so that you can use that data. And with that, I wanna make sure that we have time for questions because you folks always have some great questions. I'm gonna leave this slide up for just a minute. It has my email on it. You can find me on LinkedIn. My website is up there. I, I know this is just a, a one hour presentation that we flew through a bunch of rodent stuff, but I would be happy to talk to you folks about what's going on in your particular site, about how I may be able to help. So please copy down my information. 
uh, reach out to me by email, reach out to me on LinkedIn, whatever. Um, and I'd love to help you with individual um, problems. But uh, as you have questions, type those into the box. Simon, what have I missed in the chat? Yeah, there are um, questions and comments uh, just from uh, Monty. Uh, great presentation. Thanks a lot. I was told once by someone working in a pest control company that rats are really tricky sometimes to monitor in the outside as they have like photographic memory and record where the traps are and learn to avoid them so rats especially can be smart and if they've encountered a trap and set it off but, but not really gotten caught in it yes they absolutely learn that's a bad spot and they will avoid it absolutely plus rats um are, are what they call neophobic they're afraid of new things so when you put a new trap in their area, they're going to avoid it because it's new. It's scary. So it takes a while for them to get used to it. So, yes, absolutely. Rats are smart and they are tricky. OK, uh, William, I've been amazed at the firms I've audited that were paying for an external pest control inspection and treatment that never reviewed the reports. The reports indicated problems with the facility that were never corrected. Yes. And, and this goes back to that partnership aspect. Even if you're hiring another company, you still have your part to play. You have that that exclusion. Now, in in some of these cases, did the pest control company do a good enough job with communicating that or did they just, you know, drop a, a piece of paper on somebody's desk and leave? Um, so, again, I, I'm sus suspecting that, you know, communication failure on both ends. But if you've hired a third party, somebody should be reviewing that. Somebody should be talking to them and asking them what you need to do at your facility. Okay. Uh, Louis, Louise, at my BRCGS auditor, they asked for my external pest control to have an audit performed by another third party. Yeah, that, that can happen, um, especially, again, from what William said, you know, if they've sort of lost confidence in that pest control company, having somebody else come in and, and review things and maybe provide some suggestions is always a good thing. Okay. Uh, Edwin, how would you deal with a rodent infestation um, in addition to closure? So close, but, but are there any other things that you can do? to deal with an infestation? Um, well, there are, I mean, there's certainly treatments. I, I, I'm assuming that you're saying in addition to closure, like closing down the facility, um, once you close down so. the facility, you can do a, a deep clean, you know, really get into all those corners. Like I had that one picture of underneath that process line that obviously wasn't getting cleaned. Um, so by having a shutdown, you can do a really deep clean. You can really look at what's going on with all the machinery shut down, a little bit more quiet. It gives you a different perspective. Okay, a question from Hamid. Uh, what is the minimum number of traps, baits in food storehouse? What are the types of traps used inside food production area? Is, is there a specification or quality certificate that prohibits the use of traps inside food processing areas? Great question. Thank you for that, Hamid, because this, this comes up quite a bit. There is no minimum. There's no maximum. There's no specific distance that they have to be 20 meters apart, 30 meters apart from each other. Look at what's going on. Look at where your hot spots are. Look at where your conducive conditions are. Where do you most need traps or stations? So um, there's no audit standards. Um, there, there may be some government standards in a couple cases, but I'm not aware of that. Um, so put those devices where you need them to be, where they're going to do the most good. Um, so there's no certificate. There's no specification. It's based on what's going on and what are the conditions that you need to respond to. Okay. A question from Wang Hong No, sorry if I've got your name wrong. Uh, any experience with the traps that electrify rodents upon entry? Do you recommend them? Um, so yeah, there are there are traps that electrocute the rodent as it comes in. Um, I think that there are definitely places where those can be used. Um, I'm not a fan of them in food processing areas because um, there's often a lot of dust, and I you know once you get dust and you get food debris, it messes up the the system, and I don't think they work very well. But if you have something cleaner like a warehouse area, um, you know it it instantly kills the the rodent if it's working correctly. So just consider where you're placing those and what the conditions may be. 
Okay, a uh, question from Darmadi. How to anticipate if our facility is located next to another facility with lack of rodent control? Oh, yes, bad neighbors. What do we do about bad neighbors? <laughs> um, so I'll go back to Hamid's question here of, of, you know, where do we place traps? Well, if you have a neighbor, let's just say it's to the north side of your building and you know that they've got rodent problems, well, we make sure that we increase all the rodent control on the north side of your building because we know that that's where they're going to be coming from. So think about where they're coming from. Yeah, you can't do anything about your bad neighbor, but you can put extra protection in place along that edge, along that neighbor to prevent them from coming into your site. Okay, thanks. Uh, Elisa, um... For bait stations, after the rodent has gnawed at the bait and left the trap, would we expect to see the rodent body nearby or do their friends and family come by and pick them up? <laughs> Actually, they usually go back to their friends and family. So um, bait isn't instantaneous. Um, so once a rodent eats the bait, it takes a few hours for the body to metabolize that. So usually they run back to their home and they die in their little hole or they die in their nest. Now on occasion, um, happened to me just last week, I was outside a restaurant and I saw a rat that was in the middle of the parking lot that was still a little bit alive. You could tell it had gotten into the bait. So you will see it on occasion, but 90% of that time, that rat, that mouse is gonna run back to its home and you're never gonna see it again. Okay, what about big rats? How big can they grow to, a rat? I, you know, it's a, <laughs> which which picture do you want? I mean, you know, most rats, you know, we're we're talking. Uh, oh gosh, it depends. Norway rats are going to be a little bit bigger. I mean, we're we're talking body size about about yay yeah. big. You know, tail about okay. that long too. Okay, so anyway, a big rat. Uh, big what's rat. the most of, uh, most effective method to trap big rats? Traps, snap traps. Um, you need the rat size, the bigger snap trap. If you get that little one that's designed for the mouse, all the rat's going to do is set it off. Um, you need the bigger rat size, and and I like the plastic jaws models, not the um, not the uh, wooden ones. Um, I like the heavy duty ones because, again, for a big rat, you need that heavy duty trap. Okay, uh, question from Pradeep um, in India. Excuse me. We have received the notification that glue boards might be banned. We use them inside bait stations in food facilities. However, snap traps, multiple cages are no-no inside a food facility. What do we do if glue boards are banned and other than exclusion and using wax blocks externally? Well, I'd be curious to know why you can't use snap traps inside. Um, not sure if that's a India regulation. I know that we use snap traps inside food facilities all the time in the U.S. and Europe. Um, uh, companies that I've worked with in Africa and Asia have done that as well. So um, really, if you can't use any of those means on the inside, uh, you do have to focus on the outside. That is that is all you have left. Okay. A uh, question from Dennis. Any tips for woodchucks on a farm? <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Woodchuck. Dennis, Dennis. What's a woodchuck? A, a woodchuck is a very large rodent. Um, uh, the first thing I do is, again, we look at habitat. You know, that, that woodchuck is is after the wood. It's it's after, you know, similar to, to beavers. They're going to be in those, those damper, wetter locations. Um, again, probably live trap would be your best option there, Dennis. I don't like the sound of woodchucks. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nicholas, uh, during second party audits, we were asked to provide allergen declaration for all our non-ingredient chemicals used on site, including yep. for the toxic baits in the box stations used in external areas. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when we use baits on the inside, I'm thinking more cockroach baits and ant baits. Um, we had in the US, we can get that from our manufacturer. So go to your manufacturer of those products and they should be able to provide you with that certification. Okay, perfect. Uh, are mice neophobic? And that's a question from Brent. 
So mice are usually considered the opposite. Um, they are very curious little creatures and they like to investigate new stuff, which is why it's important to determine if you have a mouse problem or a rat problem, because those rats are going to be much less likely to go to new traps. But with mice, you actually may want to move traps around quite a bit to keep it feeling fresh and new for them. So no, mice are more curious. Okay, Eric. Uh... Glue boards or mechanical traps must be placed against the wall without any gaps. Is it also okay to have a small gap between the trap and the wall? Remember that rodents are usually running right up against that wall. They like to feel their body pressing up against that wall. So if there's a gap, they're going to go into that gap instead of into that trap. Now, the, the one exception to that is if they've gotten very comfortable and are using a different pathway, and you can kind of suss that out. But I would make sure that there is little to no gap between the wall and the trap or the glue board, because that's going to increase your chances of catching it. Okay, a uh, question from Farwa. You told in your PowerPoint that glue box is not a good option for rats. Do you, uh, which type of traps will be better in a food company? And especially for rats, it's snap traps. Um, you can use uh, live cage traps if you want to, but then you still have to dispose of the rodents. So for rats, I prefer snap traps and heavy duty. Um, again, those plastic jaws models, I think are best. Okay, question from Chandra, Chandra Shikar. How relevant is it for a food safety system to have liability insurance from the pest control agency? Oh, um, you know, that would depend on your country. In the United States, our pest control companies are licensed and insured, um, and that covers them. So I would check into your regulations, and I would check with your insurance company and ask them what they recommend on that one. Okay, Jorge, uh, how would you know um, if traps are placed correctly? Um, well, there's lots of good resources to use. Again, typically up against a wall, typically in pathways. And if you have an external pest control company doing this, ask them. Ask them why they put a trap there. They should be able to explain it. Okay. Uh, uh, Angela, may I ask if the alternative of road denticides is effective? Well, the alternative is trapping, um, of course, sanitation and exclusion to reduce their populations. Um, the problem with traps is that traps, once they go off, they have to be serviced. So with rodenticides, you could have more time between when you placed it and came back to service it. It just requires extra service usually with traps because you have to check them more often. So they're still effective, especially if they're placed correctly. Um, just a different means of control. Uh, question from Sanaz. Um, rodent control is preventive. Or is, is it preventive or corrective rodent control? If the facility is not prone to rodent, should we consider preventive actions such as snap trap? If you're a food facility anywhere in the world, you are at risk of rodents. Um, so I would have some type of preventative control because if you have nothing, then if something does get in, you have nothing to stop it. You have no alert system to tell you that problems are starting. So even if you've never had a rodent problem, I still think you need some preventative controls to tell you when a problem may be starting up. I love these questions, you know. I know, they're so uh, great. From Lexi, is it true that if you touch a trap with your bare hands when you set it, that the rodents can smell you and they forever avoid that trap? Oh, that is a great question. So <laughs> um, sort of, yes, you're right. That they, they do, our oils, our scents, it will get on the trap, which is why we recommend wearing gloves when you set traps, um, especially if you're using um, bait. Um, they won't avoid it forever. I mean, eventually, you know, within a month or so, that breaks down and it gets, you know, all the other scents on it. Um, but initially, yes, they will avoid it because it smells like people. <laughs> And they don't like people, is that correct? They don't like people, no. We kill them, so of course they don't like us. But do they know that we kill them? You know, I, I think, you know, we are a predator. I, I think, you know, whatever innate system it is, this mm. smells like a predator. This smells like something that's going to hurt me. Oh, no, did I lose Simon? <laughs> I just lost Simon. 
Okay, well, I'll, I'll come through the, the questions here. Oh, Simon's back. Okay, Simon, I lost you for a minute. Well, and you know, all the questions have disappeared for me now. It's clean. Oh, no, out. okay. Well, here, we were we were on Angela. Okay, we got Angela. Uh, rodent control is protective. Okay, uh, Stephen, regarding the use of uh, radar-enabled devices, um, I'm not aware of radar um, devices. Um, I'm aware of cameras. I'm aware of connected traps that, you know, once they go off, they send the signal and you get notified that, that a trap's gone off. Um, so I really do think that's the future of, ro of rodent control. I think it's wonderful because we know right away. We don't have to wait a week to come back or two weeks to come back to check those traps. We know immediately when a trap's gone off. Um, same thing with cameras. Um, you know, when it notices movement, it takes that picture, it sends it to your cell phone or your email. The faster we know about a problem, the faster we can do something. And the better we know of where that problem is, just like those cameras show us, my camera showed me exactly that those mice were coming out of that refrigerator. I can immediately go to that refrigerator and take care of that. Um, so Stephen, again, I'm not sure about radar, but Definitely the feature of, of rodent control is those connected devices. Um, a nod, uh, any frequency of checks for internal traps con compared to external? Um, bait stations, at least in the US, uh, we typically check those about once a month, um, sometimes twice a month. Internal traps should be probably checked once a week. Um, if there's issues, you may wanna check them more often, um, but typically once a week is what we check those. Um, okay. Ricardo, we know uh, we can use chemicals to eradicate the pests. Um, can we use biological um, aspects inside the facility? So there is a product that's being tested right now, um, which is essentially a birth control for rodents. It sounds crazy. Um, it hasn't been very effective yet, and it still, still means we have rats inside the facility. Even if they can't have babies, we still have rats. So there's not a lot going on on that biological front just yet, Ricardo, but we're keeping an eye on that. Um, Hamid, again, uh, rodents cause three types of hazards, biological, physical, and chemical. Yes, um, absolutely. The chemical aspect of, of rodents comes from um, rodenticide use. I mean, rodents themselves, it, it's the physical and biological, um, but when you're using pesticides, that would, that's what brings in the chemical aspect of that hazard on that, so. Uh, Nancy, oh, Nancy, great question. Ultrasonic rat repellers, they don't work, period. Um, I, I am not gonna sugarcoat that at all. Every single piece of research that has been done on it has shown that they are absolutely 100% ineffective. They do not work. I'm sorry, Nancy. Um, Lexi, uh, if you took, yep, we got to Lexi's question and I think, I think I got most of them. I've got one. One more, okay. Yeah, from Irina. Uh, what are the alternative bird elimination devices? The falcon type does not work. Oh, birds. I mean, that's a whole nother presentation. Irina, go ahead and email me, contact me. We'll, we'll talk about your bird problems because that's, that's a longer story. Okay, final one. Uh, Hussein, is it a legal requirement to get rid of all products in warehouse in case of an infestation or just the damaged products? So in the United States, technically, it is considered held under insanitary conditions and it cannot be sold to human food. Uh, depending on what the regulations are, where you are, that could differ. So I would check into your local regulations. That's perfect. Brilliant. Yeah, a couple of comments from Isabel and Jane. Great presentation as usual. Fantastic, Shell. Appreciate your time today and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, fascinating i love the questions as well uh brilliant. Yeah. so so thanks for everybody for engaging and uh yeah uh we've got a training course coming up in june a longer one four hour training course if you'd like to join us for that uh we'll be sending emails but you can check the website and that just briefly explain yeah do you want to briefly yeah explain it? we're going to talk about aspects of pest management as it relates to sanitation um, especially getting deeper into rodents and and the conditions that you want to look for for rodents as well as other insects um, and focusing on that that integrated system especially when it comes to sanitation i'm even gonna i, I am gonna shill and put the uh, link in the sidebar yeah. so yeah we, we, we will be putting um 
like I say, we will be sending emails out and, and things. But if you want to have a look at the content, you just click on that link and have a look. Um, okay, thanks, Shell. Uh, we'll be following up afterwards, everyone, with the recording, the slide certificate, etc. Uh, apart from that, have a good day, everybody. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend. Bye, okay. folks. Thank you. Bye-bye.